us continue our service with our prayer of preparation. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthy magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbors as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the laws and prophets. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy. The grace of God has dawned upon the world through our Savior Jesus Christ, who sacrificed himself for us to purify a people as his own. Let us confess our sins. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and against one another in thought and word and deed. We are truly sorry for our pride and for our lack of faith, of understanding and love. We repent of our narrowness, our bitterness and prejudice. Pardon and forgive us, save us and renew us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your way. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the God of all healing and forgiveness draw you to himself, that you may behold the glory of his Son, and the words may flash, and be cleansed of all your sins. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Christians throughout the world, let us say our colleague for today. God of all mercy, your son became good news to the poor, release to the captives, and freedom to the oppressed. Anoint us with your Holy Spirit and set us, all your people, free. 
to praise you in Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for our readings. Good cold morning, church. First reading today is taken from Genesis chapter 14, verses 17 through 20. After his return from the defeat of Shedoleoma and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley. And King Melchizedek of Salem brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham by God most high, maker of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him one-tenth of everything. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is taken from Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 through 10. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of mighty thunder peals, crying out, Alleluia! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. To her it has been granted to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure. For the linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are true words of God, Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your comrades who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. This is the word of the Lord. Our hymn before the Gospel reading and sermon is the lovely old hymn, Father of Heaven, whose love profound the ransom from my soul is found. 124, Father of Heaven, whose love profound, 124.
Hallelujah. Christ was revealed in flesh, proclaimed among the nations, and believed in throughout the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. The mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. And when the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the, ser the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, the things in the scriptures, they all happened a very long time ago. Help us to connect with these ancient stories now, because you are alive, because you are with us by your spirit, because you are here with us. Change us, we pray, to the glory of the Father. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Jennifer, have you still got the readings? Can I possibly have them back? Sorry, I like to have the Bible in front of me when I'm, when I'm preaching. I've actually got one of those big floppy Bibles, but unfortunately my eyes are perhaps older now. Some of you may understand. Right, okay. So I, as I intimated in my prayer, it's a very long time ago, some of these stories, and it is quite difficult difficult to connect with them and so we're going to take some time to get into the scripture before we understand quite how it applies now I'm going to be looking at Genesis this morning because it's a really lovely little uh, vignette a very little sort of a picture of uh, something that we need to remember as Christians but it did all happen a very long time ago I say that because you know that true truism that um, Queen Cleopatra is closer to us than she is to the building of the pyramids. You, you know that one? Queen Cleopatra is closer to us than she is in her day to the building of the pyramids. Um, that's probably true for this story and Jesus. So Jesus is closer in time to us than he is in his own day to the occurrences that we are reading about in Genesis. It's very old. It's the third millennium BC. Okay, it's a very, very long time ago. And so there are, there are gonna be problems if we're going to try and look at whether this is historically true. We're gonna be looking at clues rather than uh, facts. So there are uh, things in here that we can helpfully work out. So the invading army of Chedorlaomer are from uh, their Elamites, so they're from their region that we might see as sort of Iran, Iraq. They're from that sort of region. Um, we don't know really very much about them. Uh, clearly they've invaded this land, it's called Canaan, sort of, at the time. 
It doesn't really belong to anyone. They've just invaded because that's what kings do. Uh, the two kings whose lands have been invaded are the king of Solom and the king of Salem. Salem may be Jerusalem. We're not sure. Um, it's the sort of name that uh, Urusalem is definitely one of the names that was around at the time. So whether they've shortened it to Salem, we're not sure. Um, it's probably Jerusalem. Uh, king Melchizedek, it's a bit of an odd name. Uh, Melchi means king. Zedek means something like he is holy. So it's uh, Melchizedek might mean that he's a king who's also a priest, but that's not unusual in the day. They nearly all were. Um, it could be his name. They did do that sort of thing, but it might not be. It might just be a title. We're not quite sure. Um, he's bringing out bread and wine. Well, that's an ancient tradition. Oh, look, bread and wine. We'll come back to that bit. Um, he is described as a priest of God Most High. Well, there's no Jews at this time. We haven't got there yet. We haven't even, Israel hasn't even been born, much less his sons who formed the nation. There's no temple of God, so he's not a priest of God. Not our God, anyway. But he appears to be a priest of his own God. Uh, his own God is called El Elyon, which just means God Most High in Canaanite language. If you want to know all about the Ugaritic texts, do come and talk to me afterwards. It's not as interesting uh, as all that, but it's, yeah, it's quite interesting if you're into the archaeology. So he's probably priest of a god that he thinks is sort of the best one in their pantheon of gods. Do you know what I mean by pantheon of gods? That they had lots of gods. Um, they weren't necessarily the creators of the world like we think. Um, they just saw them as gods, bigger than us. So we'll, we'll have to see. We'll have to see what, what that, how that works out. Um, what else can I tell you? Abraham is Abraham, not Abraham at this stage. God hasn't done that transforming work on him yet. That comes a little bit later on when he makes him the father of many nations. So at the moment, he's just this guy wandering around in the Middle East. He's come from the Fertile Crescent. Uh, again, sort of Iran, Iraq, that sort of region. He's walked through the fertile regions and he's ended up in the land of Canaan. And he's found some people there, but he's also managed to make some space. We know that he's not just this sort of lone desert wandering Bedouin. He's uh, clearly a powerful guy. We can spot that because there's, he's got so many flocks that when he arrives in this land, it looks like they might actually strip the land of all that's uh, of all its goodness by, overfeed, by their flocks feeding. So he and his nephew Lot, they decide to go in two different directions. We know that he's a powerful military leader because when he turns up in Egypt during a famine, they do manage to throw him out, but what they don't do is kill him. So clearly he's armed to the teeth and got an army worthy of uh, having a little go at the Egyptians and giving them something to think about. So they get rid of him, but they don't kill him. This is the third millennium BC. Iron hasn't been invented yet. It's a very, very long time ago. So what on earth is it doing in our scriptures? Well, that's the interesting bit. Because we don't read the scriptures to get history. We read the scriptures to get meaning. God has given us these scriptures and has spoken to us through the Holy Spirit we have been passing down these stories from generation after generation. First, they were told uh, in that lovely and amazing oral tradition where people spoke these stories. For thousands of years, they spoke these stories carefully, one to another, over and over again, making sure that they were remembered in their exact form, spoken and repeated and repeated and repeated. Eventually, they did write them down about two and a half thousand years ago they start writing them down maybe a bit longer and then our Jewish brothers and sisters kept them and treasured them and in the time of Jesus uh, his new followers who became the Christians they started writing them down they wrote them down in their own languages and they passed them on to us today 
and there's a reason for that. God's Holy Spirit is speaking through those thousands of years to us today. Now, there are all kinds of things we can draw from this, and I just want to pick out a few of these ideas that are going on here. So, you've got the background. Now, let's see what it's all about. So, you've got these two kings, the king of Salem and the king of Sodom. Do you know anything about Sodom? Have you heard that word before? Have you heard of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah? Um, Sodom and Gomorrah come up, so there are some pretty horrific things happen there. The king of Sodom doesn't turn out to be that nice a guy. Uh, the people of Sodom clearly pick up on who he is and decide to go for that full-throatedly. Uh, they are probably the most ungenerous and ungracious hosts in the world. Uh, God has something to say about that. If you know the end of that story, uh, you know what happens. If you don't know the end of that story, can I suggest you go and read it? It involves all exciting things like fire from heaven. Um, Jesus uh, speaks about Sodom and Gomorrah, about people who don't receive the teaching of preachers who were sent to them in his name. Uh, he says it will be worse for those people on the day of judgment than it will be for, the, for Sodom and Gomorrah. So, you know, clearly it's something to do with the way in which we receive each other, the way in which we are hospitable to one another, the way in which we are kind and generous with one another, probably worth paying attention to. Um, so, the king of Sodom, in fact, in this story, we don't really get his story, it just says that he was there, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shiva, which is the king's valley, okay, uh, may or may not be. But the king of Sodom, he doesn't turn out to be that generous. So what's happened is, is that you've got this invading king, you interested? Do you want to know? Okay, Chedon Leome, he's invaded, big army, looks like he's going to win. Kings of, kings of Sodom and Salem go out to try and meet him in battle, lose miserably. All of their people get stolen, all of their stuff gets stolen. And they turn to Abraham and say, please save us. Now, Abraham, with his massive army, uh, goes out and defeats King Chedorlaomer. And he comes back with all of the people and all of the stuff. And the response of the king of Sodom is to say, that's my stuff, give it here. Give me my stuff back. Now, in the ancient Near East, if you won a battle, anything you won in battle belongs to you. Right? He's got rid of the king, so you got your lands back, but the booty from the battle, that belongs to Abraham. And the king of Sodom is demanding it back. That's not very gracious, to put it mildly. Abraham's response is the same response that I've seen lots of other people give across time. You want your stuff back? You can have your stuff back. Take it. Be my guest. It happens sometimes in the church as well. Uh, sometimes it's, it's a classic clergy response when someone comes to a clergy person and says, I give a lot of money to this church and I think that that should afford me some influence. To which the clergy will normally say, if you didn't give it as a gift, you can have it back. It's exactly what Abraham did. You, you want your stuff? You want, it, you want your power and influence? That's absolutely fine. You take it, you take your power and influence, and you take it over there because we're not interested. It's essentially what um, Abraham says to, to uh, the king of Sodom. You see it in lots of ways. There are lots of things that people think that their, their membership, their, uh, their money, their position in life should afford them a certain amount of uh, something that they see belongs to them. That's not the Christian way. The Christian way is the self-emptying way where we give up everything and we don't claim those things to ourselves and we're much more like Abraham. We say, it's fine. I don't need any of that stuff. Okay, you say, it should belong to me. I'm, I'm not interested. So that's the king of Sodom. We know how his story ends. Much more interesting is, the, is King Melchizedek. Now he brings out bread and wine. King Melchizedek brings out bread and wine. Now, in the ancient world, bread and wine were the food of kings. If you were an ordinary person, you got bread and water. But bread and wine is the food of kings. So, King Melchizedek is saying something about what he thinks of Abraham. Now, that's really interesting. Because you and I are going to go out into the world in our weekly lives 
and we're going to meet people who don't necessarily subscribe to the same religion as us. They don't really, they kind of might say something like, I, I, I don't really do organized religion, or I don't like church, or I'm not a Christian, or, you know, that's fine, that's your faith, but it's not mine. I, I don't know about Melchizedek's relationship with God, or his God, or any God. But I do know that he recognizes in Abraham something special. And it's so special that it actually keeps being recounted in Scripture. It's recounted in Psalm 110, the my Lord said to, um, the Lord said to my Lord. And, um, and it talks about, you are a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And later on, Jesus again quotes that Psalm. And then later on, again, in the book of Hebrews, it's recounted again. Melchizedek is an important character. He tells us something about how people can come to God. God doesn't just welcome people who subscribe to the right beliefs. God subscribes to the people, God, God uh, welcomes the people who have the right actions. And here, Melchizedek is treating Abraham as if he were a king. He is welcoming him, he is being hospitable, gracious, he asks for nothing back, he expresses gratitude uh, and admiration. This is really impressive. When we go out into the world, there will be times when people will say to us things that are in absolute agreement with our Christian faith. And they might even give us more honor and respect than we think is due to us. And we should receive that with graciousness. Because they're not responding to us. They're responding to God among us. God is with us. God does not need us to go out into the world to tell other people about God because he can't do it on his own. He's God. He's already doing it. He's already out there interacting with people. But secondly, there's Abraham's response. Abraham, you notice, the way he responds to Melchizedek is to make him an offering of a tenth. Now, he's given 90% to the king of Sodom. No, fine, take your stuff. But it means nothing. The tenth is important. Because a tenth in the ancient world is a sign of giving to someone divine. Giving to something that connects us with God. We still do it today. Many Christians, including myself, will give a tenth of everything that we have to God. Not because uh, we... We, we want to give to something to make something happen or to give to keep the lights on or anything like that, but to God. And that giving of a tenth is a way of saying, you are someone special in God's eyes. This is, an, this is an encounter where God has been present. And that recognition between the two from different faiths that something divine is going on is really important in our understanding of the world. Because if we go out to the world and think we've got all the answers and we think we can tell other people what to do and how to behave and what they should do and, 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 and that really the only success is when they come to church, we have failed to understand the work of God. The work of God is happening in the world every day, every moment of every day. Our job is to have eyes and hearts open to where God is doing something and to know how to respond to it with graciousness and recognition. Melchizedek and Abraham are able to do that with one another, and we need to ask ourselves, how do we do that? Are we going out into the world, and every time we meet someone, are we, have we got our eyes open to what God is doing? And where we see it, are we able to say so? Now, Abraham and Melchizedek are able to say so without words, other than the blessing, the beautiful blessing that that Melchizedek gives to Abraham. But other than that, there are no words spoken. They just recognize God's action in one another by the way in which they respond. And 90% of the time, that will be how we are able to do it with other people. How? How do we do that? Well, the first thing is to make sure that like Abraham, we've said our prayers, that we have a relationship with God. That's the most important thing. Because if you have a relationship with God, you know what he looks like, you know how he acts, you know how he speaks, you know how these things work in the world. We know his scriptures well enough to know that, oh, this is something of God. We recognize this. This is familiar. 
That connection that we have with God, that relationship, allows us to establish relationships with other people. So when we go into a situation and we recognize that familiarity, oh, this is something where God is present, we are able to say and respond to that person as if they were somehow connected to God. The way in which we speak with them, the way in which we express our generosity to them, the way in which we are able to support and uphold them. Now, the simplest way is where we get involved in charitable work. That's the most obvious way in the, in the modern world. I'm sure many of us will give to charities, but this isn't about giving money. This is about engaging in relationship. And all charities are the same. They, they will say, it's great when people give us money, but what we really want alongside that is to establish relationship with our donors, to establish a relationship with the work that we do so that people become interested and pay attention. So that's the obvious way of doing it. But again, most of our days are not spent in charitable work. We meet relatives, friends, work colleagues, school friends, all sorts of people. Some are higher, some are lower than us in the, in the sort of the community in which we live. It doesn't really matter. The question that we're asking is, where is God in this? And as Christians, that's literally what we're supposed to do. When we go from here, when I say, go in peace to love and serve the Lord, or rather, it's normally Loretta that says that, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. That's what love and serve the Lord actually means. It means, go be like Abraham. Look for the things that God is doing. Change the world for other people. Give generously to those things where God is clearly at work. Receive the blessings of those who don't share our faith. That is what this is about. We don't need to be like the king of Sodom going, that's mine, come over here, give me that, that belongs to me. That's not how we act. What we do is we go and we bless and we give out and we empty ourselves because that is what Christ did. Now I want to come back to this bread and wine. Bread and wine is royal food. And... Melchizedek, the priest king, gives bread and wine. Jesus, our priest king, gives us bread and wine. Our response to that should be the gratitude and the generosity of our lives. Not because we won a great battle and our own strength, but because God has recognized us as of value and of his, worthy of his love, even though we are not. And our response is to, is to say to him, and you are my God, and I give everything to you. Remember that as we receive bread and wine, because you will receive bread and wine in the world. Others will give it to you. It might be real bread and real wine, or it might be another thing where they recognize God in you, and our job is to respond to them with the same graciousness as Abraham. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your good work in us. Thank you for your good work in those who do not share our faith. Thank you that you are ever active in this world, bringing peace and hope and love in the most challenging of lives and circumstances. We pray that we may recognize you this week, see you in our lives, and be able to respond to you, be it in the most strange of circumstances. Thank you for all that you are doing. Open our eyes to the wonders of your love. In Jesus Christ, amen. Let's stand together and profess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, 
for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So let's kneel in prayer as Kaywell leads us in our intercession. The response this morning is, Lord of glory, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for churches today, whether worshiping in tiny chapels or in great cathedrals, to praise and to hear your word. Give us a sense of expectation as we enter to share a common faith and hope and a sense of inspiration as we leave. Lord of glory, hear our prayer. Lord, we remember the divisions in your church and pray that all be united in love and in service to you. As we dare to hear news of disaster, help us not to become insensitive to world events and respond with what help we can. We pray for our fellow Christians throughout the world thinking particularly of all those for whom worshiping will lead in them into danger. Be near them and give them courage and strength in their witness. We ask you to uphold all ministers and leaders as they are guarded in your way. We pray for Bishop Nick, our church chair at St. Paul's, Canon Ant, and all who share in the church's mission in our community and Rev. Lorita. Lord of glory, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for the world that we live in, a global village thanks to modern communications. Help us to use its resources properly, that we do not waste today what should be saved for tomorrow. Lord of glory, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for the leaders of the world, Help them so that together they pursue the, and search for peace and pray for those parts of this world where life is a continual struggle and where peace is too often a dream drowned under a sea of ongoing violence. Help us to become peacemakers in our neighborhoods with those we meet. Lord, we continue to pray for all who work for justice and solidarity that they will continue to seek an end to the suffering caused by war and violence, injustice and inequality, disease and prejudice, poverty and helplessness, and bring healing to the world. Lord of glory, hear our prayer. Lord, this world is a place of greed and minimal concern for your wonderful creation and has brought about prosperity for some and poverty for others. Help us never to forget that we are guardians of the many treasures which we possess. We thank you for the strength you give us to build our community, to maintain our settled routines of caring and sharing. Lord of glory, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for ongoing debates about our criminal justice system. 
We feel for each family who fall victim to youth violence, a culture and mindset that we cannot comprehend and pray for leadership and healing in those troubled homes. Govern the hearts and minds of our government and those in authority, and may the good of all be their principal aim. In all these aspects of our life, there is a growing need to fill the spiritual vacuum in many people's lives, and that with God's grace, we continue to be a source of comfort and strength for all those who seek it. Lord of glory, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for those who suffer mental and physical anguish. We bring before you those known to our congregation here, or known to us personally, who are in any sort of need at this time. We name them in our hearts in a moment of silence, and ask that your healing touch be felt in their lives, and that they know your peace. We bring before you in the quietness of our minds those people for whom we have a special concern. In this silence, let us pray for the sick and the sorrowing, the lonely and the oppressed, those who mourn or struggle for meaning in their lives, all for whom today will be marked by difficulty beyond their hopes, beyond their powers to cope. We pray for the family of the Dismals as we remember them today. Lord of glory, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for those in our midst and the wider community who face that pain of grief at the loss of a loved one, and pray for those who have departed this life and ask you, through your loving kindness, to have mercy on their souls. Be with the bereaved in their loneliness and give them the faith to look beyond their present troubles. Lord of glory, hear our prayer. Lord, we thank you for the opportunities in the life of our church to offer support and comfort to the bereaved. We pray for those who minister to people in our community at this most vulnerable time of their lives. We pray for staff in our hospitals, emergency services, and for selfless service and dedication that makes a difference. Lord of glory, hear our prayer. Faithful God, as we prepare for the weeks ahead, help us to remember that we are sisters and brothers in Christ. Help us to overcome our conflicts, our divisions, and our self-seeking, and to be united to one another by the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray for those who have recently departed. May they rest in your love and be renewed and restored by your almighty power and comfort. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand as we prepare to offer each other a sign of peace. Our Savior Christ is the peace, is the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there, is, there shall be no end. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us offer each other a sign of peace.
offer tree hymn is number 315, Lord of our life and God of our salvation. Now, if you're wondering where the young people are today, they are thoroughly enjoying themselves in the hall, and we will join them later on. Uh, so I'll, I'll either say enjoy the peace and quiet, or um, I'm sorry that they can't join us, depending on where you're at with that. But let's sing together number 315, Lord of our life and God of our salvation. to the Lord our God. All honour and praise be yours always and everywhere, mighty Creator, ever-living God, through Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord. For at this time we celebrate your glory made present in our midst. In the coming of the Magi, the King of all the world was revealed to the nations. In the waters of baptism, Jesus was revealed as the Christ, the Saviour sent to redeem us. In the water made wine, the new creation was revealed at the wedding feast. Poverty was turned to riches, sorrow into joy. Therefore, with all the angels of heaven, we lift our voices to proclaim the glory of your name and sing our joyful hymn of praise.
praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit, that broken bread and wine outpoured may be for us the body and the blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread and gave it to them and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again, he praised you and gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. So, Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence, his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. And bringing before you the bread of life and the cup of salvation, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Lord of all life, help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people, gather us in your loving arms and bring us with all the saints to feast at your table in heaven, through Christ, and with Christ, and in Christ. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, O loving Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Believing the promises of God, as our Saviour has taught us, so we kneel to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. We break the bread of life, and that life is the light of the world. God's holy gifts for God's holy people.
Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Notices. So there's a notice that's appeared on my piece of paper, and I'm just making sure I've got the context right. Because there's a guild meeting after, our, after the service. And it says, please see Joe if you are able to offer to pick up some of our precious folks. Yes. For the meeting. No, no, sorry. Oh, for the food next week. Oh, for the food yeah. next week. That's where I was getting confused. Sorry. Great. So I'll do this bit first. So next week's service is at 9.30, yeah? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Okay, yes. thank goodness for that, right. Because uh, we're going to have a joint service, uh, lovely, I love doing these, for our, um, for our patronal festival. We, re we remember the conversion of St. Paul's. I'm very, St. Paul, I'm very, I'd be nice to have the conversion of St. Paul's as well, wouldn't it? But, you know, that's different. Um, I'm very grateful to uh, Kathy and Missy and Sarah and to the other folk who are doing, I know the Guild are heavily involved as well, in um, getting our brunch ready. Now remember that there is a table decoration competition. Get into your groups and decorate those tables. Don't hold back now. Uh, also there may be folk who are, shall we say, infrequent attenders at St Paul's who you would really like to be more among us than they are. In which case, please do invite them, best thing, as Joe says, to pick them up. Particularly members of our guild. Uh, it would be lovely to have as many members of our guild here as we can. I know that not everyone is able to get out every week, but sometimes if we let them know it's a special occasion, they can steal themselves uh, to, to get out for that one occasion. And uh, some are just... Some are just infrequent. Let's see if we can make them feel included. Um, is there anything else I need to say about the lunch? Which I, sorry, I keep calling a brunch. Because it's 11.30. But it's lunch. It's an early lunch. There you go. It'll be great fun. I'm actually genuinely looking, really looking forward to it. It's going to be great fun. Um, birthdays this week. We've, um, we've already wished Pamela Barrett Nolan, our lay reader, a happy birthday at 8 o'clock, where she was this morning. Um, Emily, it's also your birthday. I believe it's your birthday today. Uh, uh, 21 again? Fantastic, that's quite right. Uh, for those of us who uh, remember our uh, previous organist, Winton Brangman, uh, happy birthday to him as well. Uh, if you know Winton well, you'll know that Winton will be partying it up somewhere in the United States of America. But Winty, when you look in, <laughs> happy birthday from all of us here. Uh, it's also Mingo's birthday this week. So Mingo was here at 8 o'clock. Um, so it's Mingo's birthday this week, and Mingo's got a, a bit of a thing going on. I don't know whether I should mention it to you or not, but if you're not quite sure what the thing is and you want to give thanks for Mingo, there's a way of doing it. If you've no idea who Mingo is, you let off. Uh, but for, for those of us who know and love Mingo, she's got a birthday with an O. I know. And it's not the one you might be thinking. It's the next one. And I, I know I can't believe it either, and I refuse to accept it, because I swear she's the same age as me. But there you go. Speaking of young, Maureen, it's your birthday. That's next week. It's next it's week. coming week. It's the week after. It's the week after. So when is the 27th then? Is that, is that not before next Sunday? Saturday. That's Saturday, isn't it? Whatever, I don't know. Because the 28th is the Sunday, so okay. it's this week. Okay. So we're going to wish you a happy birthday this week, whether you like it or not. <laughs> 21 again. Sorry? Are you 21 again? Um, how about, yeah, that's fine. 
She'll take that. <laughs> 21. Excellent. Can we sing happy birthday to all those folk? We don't have uh, alarm here today. She's taking a well-deserved break. Uh, let's just sing loudly. You ready? Yeah. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Lovely. Now, I don't know whether the children will have uh, ended their movie yet. They've been... Oh, I'll let them explain to you. I'm not going to do it for you. We're going to stand together and we're going to receive God's blessing and sing ourselves out into the world. Feeling old, Laria. Get into your bones. Christ, the Son of God, perfect in you the image of his glory and gladden your hearts with the good news of his kingdom and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Our last hymn is number 311. 311, which is Lord Jesus Christ. You have come to us, living Lord. Before we go, you will remember that we have two little children that are usually sitting up here playing around, and the last few Sundays, what would they say? It's my mama's birthday. But because of Sunday school, they're not here. So when we go down in the hall, please let the two know that we did say happy birthday to their mother. Okay? Because we're not getting in trouble because Sunday school kept them down there. Okay, never got that straight. The second thing is, everyone's facing forward. 
Anyone standing behind Ken and Ant, don't look at him. The rest of us, it is curled over. Let us pray for some warmth, because he does not feel it. That's why you're going home for your other coat. I know you're curled. <laughs> it's going to warm up, folks. It's going to get over 60. I know this. Before all that said, thank you, James. Okay. We have seen his glory, the glory revealed to all the nations. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. Thank mm -hmm. you. 